Good morning, everyone. Thank you for having me back at Alstonville. It's really nice to be back, um, to see all the faces that are familiar, um, to hear the wonderful music. Thanks, Josh, for worship coordinating. Um, you pretty much nailed all my big points already with the children's story and the songs. Um, so mine just an adjunct to Josh. Um, I'll just pray before we start, if that's okay. Dear Heavenly Father, um, I just want to thank you so much that we have the opportunity to be here today to worship you, um, to commemorate your Sabbath and your wonderful act of creation. Um, I just thank you for keeping us all safe up here. Um, I pray that you be with the rest of Australia as they're um, fighting the fires um, and the disasters that are happening overseas as well. Um, I just pray that you be with us all today. Send your Holy Spirit to be amongst our congregation. Um, I please pray that you speak through me. Um, please bypass my mouth so that you speak through me and it's not my words that get in the way. Um, in your name, amen. Um, so a couple of weeks ago, my cousin Kyle came up. He needed some wisdom teeth out. Um, so me and Dad happily obliged. We took him into hospital and took out four of his pearly whites. Um, Kyle's been my cousin, well he's older than me, so my whole life. Um, he's been one of my closest friends too. Um, he's one of those friends that when you catch up with them again, you just slip right back into what it was like before you were separated. Um, Kyle's an electrician and at the moment he's out um, at a rural Queensland town working on the electronics in some of these um, wind turbines. Um, he was telling me a little bit about that. Um, we were just catching up about our lives and what they're up to now. Um, we are reflecting about um, the state of the world, what our childhoods were like, um, and how blessed we really were to have the family that we had. Um, we had a family that cheered for us and supported us, and we, um, we both came to the realisation that that was actually really rare, and that we were super, super blessed for having that a part of our experience. Um, the town that Kyle's at. Um, he was telling me about some of the kids and the families that he sees out there. Um, and me and Kyle were both quite driven people, um, same as Kirsten and Mia, the other cousin. Um, but Kyle out, out there doesn't see the same drive, um, and he doesn't seem that um, the kids have the same kind of champions that we have in our family. Um, he saw that there was a difference in the attitude of the society around them. Um, Kyle and I, we're both fixers. If we see a problem, we just want to fix it. Um, and it was hard to find a solution to this problem that Kyle saw out in this town. Um, there was a big silence as we kind of sat there thinking about the kids and the families out there um, and what could be done. And then, and then Kyle just said to me that he just wants them to want to be better. Um, and we agreed that if the peoples themselves don't want want to change for themselves, there's not much that can be done. Um, the simple complexity of what Kyle said to me really stuck, um, and I think there's nothing that anyone can do to change their motivations. You can try to do um, different programs, give good examples, but nothing will ultimately change unless the people th themselves decide that they want to change. I think this is a problem that infects us all. Um, we know about the problem of sin as Christians. Um, we've grown up hearing stories from the Bible um, and we know that it affects us all. I think what Kyle said about wanting them to want it is the same attitude that God has towards us. Um, he wants us to want him. He won't force us into a change that we don't welcome ourselves. He wants instead for us to want to want to change and allow him to come in and change our lives. God wants us to love him. He is a relational God. And what a wonderful thought that the most powerful being in the universe cares about having a personal relationship with every single one of us as individuals. Love cannot be love without free will. If love is coerced, it cannot be true. This means that God must allow us to choose him, but it must allow him to also not choose him. This choice will not be forced, which leaves God in the situation that I was talking about earlier, where he just has to want us to want him. 
and needs to allow us to let him into our lives to change them. Psalms 51 addresses this problem of dealing with inadequacies of the human heart um, and desires. And I think it's what God, what it looks like to want to be like God. Um, before we read it in full, I'll have a look at the context that what it was written in. Um, Psalms 51 was written in a, by King David in a time of his life when he was dealing with a lot of guilt and inadequacy on reflection of his condition. Um, I'll read through 2 Samuel 11 and we'll skip a few verses to just kind of get the context of the story. So this is 2 Samuel chapter 11. Then it happened one evening that David arose from his bed and walked on the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful to behold. So David sent and inquired about the woman, and someone said, Is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Then David sent messengers and took her, and she came to him. And he lay with her, for she was cleansed from her impurity, and she returned to her house. And the woman conceived, so she sent and told David, and said, I am with child. In the morning it happened that David wrote a letter to Joab, and sent it by the hand of Uriah. And he wrote in the letter, saying, Set Uriah in the forefront of the hottest battle, and retreat from him, that he may be struck down and die. So it was, while Joab besieged the city, that he assigned Uriah to a place where he knew there were valiant men. Then the men of the city came out and fought with Joab, and some of the people of the servants of David fell, and Uriah the Hittite died also. When the, wife of the, when the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah, her husband, was dead, she mourned for her husband. And when her mourning was over, David sent and brought her to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. Psalms 51 is the response of David to his realisation that he's affected with the problem of sin. I'm going to read the psalm through in full. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness. According to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, uh, against you, you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight, that you may be found when you speak <coughs> and blameless when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part you will make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me hear joy and gladness. That the bones you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore me to the joy of your salvation, and uphold me by your generous spirit. Then I will teach trans transgressors your ways, and sinners shall be converted to you. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God, the God of my salvation. And my tongue shall sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall show forth your praise. For you do not desire sacrifice, or else I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. These, O God, you will not despise. Do good in your good pleasure to Zion. Build the walls of Jerusalem. Then you shall be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness, with burnt offering and whole burnt offering. Then they shall offer bulls on your altar. In verses 3 and 5, David acknowledges his struggle with sin. David realizes that he is sinful and that he was brought into a world where he has a natural inclination for sin. He recognizes that from even before the first breath he took, he had sinful tendencies. David has come to realise that there is something within him that inclines him towards evil. 
In Jeremiah 17, verse 9, we read what it is that inclines us toward evil. The heart is deceitfully as... Sorry. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Ever since the first sin in the Garden of Eden, our resting state is to be in sin. This is because sin is a condition of the heart caused by separation between God and man. The original sin in the garden wasn't just the eating of a fruit. It was the choice to be self-reliant rather than to be fully reliant on God. Sin is more than just the actions performed or words spoken. Sinfulness is an attitude that arises from the core, from the wickedness of the heart. From the heart, sinfulness manifests itself in words and actions, but the problem and thus the solution must arise from the core. What does God want us to realise that he desires to find in our heart? Truth. In verse 6 of Psalms 51, we read that God desires truth in the inward parts and wisdom in the hidden parts. God already knows what he'll find when he looks in our hearts. He knows that he won't find what he's looking for. But he still wants more for us because he loves us. He doesn't want us to remain wallowing in our sinfulness, no. He wants to transform our lives so that we have the truth of his love at our core. And then, only then, will our lives begin to look more like his. John 14.6 tells us what the truth is. Jesus is the truth, the way, and the life. God wants to search our hearts along with us, for us to realise our own depravity. He wants us to see how far we have strayed, and he has given us the perfect example of Jesus to show us what a heart that is truthful looks like. God wants us to be so much like him and loved us so much that he would give his son to come down and die for us, just so that we have the ability to make the choice for ourselves about what resides in our heart. Jesus' death didn't guarantee that we would make the right decision to have a new heart, but it gave us the option to give our heart to God and let him transform it so that he can find truth and not only wickedness. Verses 16 and, in 16 and 17, we read that God desires more than just the sacrifice of a burnt offering. He wants the sacrifice of a surrendered heart and spirit. Burnt offerings were given daily for the repentance of sins. They are established by God after Adam and Eve, and Adam and Eve left the garden in recognition of the requirement to shed blood for the give, forgiveness of sins. God wants more than just our routine sacrifices, though. He wants something radical. He wants our lives. He accepted the burnt offerings, but once the bull is dead, he can't do anything with it. What, can work, what God can work with is a heart humbled before him and ready to be moulded into a new creation for God. David is beginning to realise that God wants, um, God wants us to want him rather than just wanting his forgiveness. God wants to change David's heart because a changed heart is so much more powerful and useful than one that is only forgiven. Once we have given our hearts to God, submitted our own wills to him, then he is able to transform our lives so that we can walk with him. This passage makes me think about the offerings given by Cain and Abel. Um, they They both offered burnt offerings, but Abel offered his heart and his spirit, while Cain did not have a sacrificial attitude. Verse 10 is the pinnacle of Psalms 51. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. After David has struggled with the problem of sin in action, he has realised that this sin is arising from the very core of who he is, his heart. Um, The Hebrew word used in this verse for heart, um, it's spelt leb, but it's pronounced lave. I'm going to talk about it a little bit more throughout the sermon. Um, It means both the literal anatomical heart, but it also encapsulates a lot more complex um, definitions. Um, It talks about the inner man, about the mind, about the will, about the understanding, um, about your knowledge, um, your inclinations, your determinations, um, where you find your resolution, your conscience, um, and the seat of emotions and passions. Um, It's the foundation of what makes a person who they are and it drives what they do 
And this is what David is asking God to make new within him. He realises his need for a new mind, new inclinations, a renewed understanding, a new determination and a reinvigorated passion. This is what David realises he needs. David, David is asking for a new core, a change in heart. After verse 10 in Psalms 51, we begin to see how the change in heart manifests in David. The joy of God's salvation is restored to David. He begins to see the salvation of God in a new light, not as a transaction where if he offers the right offerings, he will earn God's favour, but begins to see that God loves him and wants the best for him. The joy of God's salvation is that he wants to give it to us. He wants us to be saved. This is a transformative realisation for David. And in 13, we begin to see what David look, David's life begins to look like. After David has realised the joy of God's salvation, he can then begin to share the good news with others around him and teach sinners and transgressors, transgressors the true nature of God, that he loves us and wants us to be in relationship with him more than anything in this world and is willing to offer us a new heart. Isn't this good news? God loves us. What a powerful and transformative truth. I think as Christians, we can get numb to the words that God loves us. But when you think about it, when you really think about it, <sighs> isn't it wild that the God who created everything is above the confines of time and space can speak solar systems into existence and just as easily speak and they disappear. The King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, this same God, loves David, loves me and loves you. And the thing that he cares about most in the universe is that it's you. It's clear that this is an attractive truth and that of course sinners will be converted. It's beautiful. We're seeing the reaction of life changed in verses 14 and 15. David can't but help sing the praises of God when he realises this. This is the reality of a change in heart. Verse 10 is the pivot point for this change in attitude and what we need in this church for revival today. Romans 12, verse 1 to 2 says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. God wants us to live our lives as a living sacrifice so that this radical reality of his love can be fully appreciated and our lives can be changed. God wants our, us um, to live our lives as a living, living sacrifice. Um, if you've ever listened to Pastor David Ashwick preach a sermon, um, you might have heard him talk about a squircle. Um, it's his word that he made up to describe something that's in between a square and a circle. Um, it's something that can't really exist and that you can't really understand. Um, and I think a living sacrifice is one of those things. A sacrifice involves something dying. So how can a sacrifice be living at the same time? Um, I think the solution to this is by um, the renewing of the heart every single day. I know that Old Test the New Testament isn't written in Hebrew, um, so the lave in this verse, um, the renewing of a mind, doesn't quite fit. Um, but I believe that this is the point the verse is making still. We cannot remain static in our relationship with God. A change in heart isn't a once-off binary on or off decision. To be a living sacrifice requires the constant renewal and revival of our hearts, our understandings, our desires, our motivations. 
They must be dynamically changing in response to the will of God. This involves a dynamic change for as long as we're alive. Every single day, we must offer our hearts to God for him to change so that he can change them again and again and again. A single change isn't good enough. Our hearts must be renewed constantly. When Jesus is talking to Nicodemus in John 3, this is what he says to him as well. Unless you have a new heart, you will not be saved. Same as Josh's um, children's story about the monkey pretending to be a lion. He can't be a lion unless he's born again as a lion. Um, 1 Thessalonians 5, um, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Our lives should be offered as a continual prayer to God, a constant sacrifice of our wills, of our lives to God. Like David, this continual change in heart, surrendering of our lives to God will, rejoice, will result in us rejoicing always in the reality of God's salvational power and this newfound reality that he loves us and wants to save us. There will always be new understanding to be sought. God wants us to continually grow in our understanding of him and not remain static or stagnant. God wants for us both a change in heart and a dynamically changing heart for us to live our lives like his. At the start of the book of Revelation, there are letters written to a number of churches in the Middle East. Um, they were literal brick and mortar churches with real congregations, but we as a church believe also that these letters um, are written to um, the churches in the future and they represent the state of God's people um, as you approach the end of time. The last church that is written to is the church of Laodicea and it's the time period that we most, um, most accurately reflect ourselves onto. Um, to close, I'm just going to read the whole letter of, um, to the church of Laodicea. It's found in Revelation chapter 3. And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things, says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither hot nor cold, nor cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cot, cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich, and white garments, that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eye salve, that you may see. As many as I love are rebuke and chasten, therefore be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. We can see that there's a problem with passion in this church. They are neither hot nor cold. They are lukewarm. They have not remained dynamic, but have stagnated. We also see that they do not have a proper understanding of their condition. They do not even realise that they are poor, blind and naked. This, to me, sounds a lot like the town that Kyle was working in, where they don't even realise the severity of their condition and that they are missing out on so much. Saints of God, this is us as a church. He's shown to us in Psalms 51 what it looks like to have our hearts changed. And in scriptures, he demonstrates his faithfulness to do it. Hebrews 10, for he who promised is faithful. Hebrews 13, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today and forever. Lamentations 3, great is your faithfulness. Malachi 3, for I am the Lord, I do not change. Acts 13, um, he raised up for them David as a king, to whom he also gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, who will do all my will. From this man's seed, according to the promise, 
God raised up for Israel a saviour, Jesus. David is remembered as the man after God's own heart simply because he recognised that his own heart was broken and all he had to do was ask God for a new one like his. We too can be men and women after God's own heart once we recognise our need for a saviour and reach out to God to give our lives as a constant living sacrifice to him. God is providing the solution to our Laodicean condition. He's knocking on the door, knocking to come into our hearts and change them, and dynamically change them to be more like his. Will we let him in? Father in heaven, um, I just want to thank you again that we can be here. Um, Thank you for your willingness and your faithfulness to create in us new hearts for you. I just pray that you forgive our transgressions um, and give us all new hearts here today so that we can realise the joy of your salvation. I pray that you invigorate, reinvigorate our passion in this church. Help us to be on fire for you. Give us your Holy Spirit. In your name, amen.